All right, it's seven o'clock. Let's go ahead and get started. My name is Madeline Wolski. I'm the business librarian here at Champaign Public Library, and this is Artpreneurship Making the Cut. This is an amazing opportunity for our community to talk to some panelists who organize these amazing events and can provide you some awesome opportunities. So first off, if you have any questions about Champaign Public Library services, feel free to go to our website at champaign.org. You can book a one-on-one -on -one session with myself or any of our other very skilled librarians. You can chat with us during open hours, or you can send us an email to librarian at champaign.org. This webinar this evening will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel. So if you have to leave, no worries, I'll be sending you a copy of it. Now, so during the webinar this evening, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, raise your hand also if you would like to verbalize a question and I can unmute you. So this is a webinar versus a meeting format. So we can definitely work around it if you'd like to talk with our panelists. Um, just give us a heads up by throwing up your hand or messaging us in the chat. Um, also, if you have any troubleshooting issues, um, tech help, uh, feel free to message as well and I can help you work through it. So. Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and stop screen sharing and we're going to have our four panelists introduce themselves. So first up, we have Anna Gooch. Hello, my name is Anna Gooch. Good evening, everyone. Um, I, I am happy to be here. I organize the mistletoe market with a few other people in town, and I'm looking forward to organizing a new event that's called BAM. All right. I think we're going out a little bit with the internet connection, Anna, but from what I heard, you organize the mistletoe markets and also own Papapo. Did you want to add anything else? No, let's go ahead. Let's keep going. Okay, great. Mariah, please let us know who you are and what you do. Awesome. My name's Mariah, and I'm the owner of Buy Black Shambana, and we are home to Champaign County's Black-owned business directory filled with over 150 businesses. Our goal is to create space for minority-owned businesses to spotlight their business, uh, share with others, and help increase revenue and sales among their businesses. We host a lot of annual events, um, but one of our biggest events and one that I wanted to speak to you all about tonight was the Urban Market Pop-Up Shop. And this market is a bit unorthodox and where we serve people who have faced barriers um, going into different markets around town. And so I'm looking forward to sharing tonight, especially with these uh, lovely ladies. And I think that Champaign County offers something for everyone. So thank you so much, Mariah. Looking forward to learn more about it. All right, Rachel. Hello, everybody. I'm the City of Urbana's Arts and Culture Coordinator. Um, one of the things that we most um, get known for are our Urbana Arts Grants. So we give out about $90,000 annually in individual artist grants to artists or arts groups, um, nonprofits, and all, all number of things. Um, we give out grants in three different categories, so Tier 1, 2, and 3. One is our smallest grant category. They're $500 to $1,500 grants. Our mid-size category is 2,000 to 4,500, and our tier three category is 5,000 to $10,000, typically more for our larger scale festivals and events. Um, apart from our arts grant program, which I should mention, we also have a specific arts in the schools grant that we give out. So if you are interested in collaborating with an Urbana School District 116 school um, as part of arts curriculum during school hours, that's another thing that we give out funding for. Um, but then we also have a number of programs that we regularly run that we also book artists for. Um, and so these are things like our Art Now, which are our monthly TV shows featuring different artists um, that are put on YouTube. So it's a web series and airs on UPTV6. We've got something called Artists of the Corridor, where we have art artists exhibit either solo or group exhibits as part of the City Hall and the Urbana Free Library collaborating together on sort of a dual site exhibit. Um, we have a program called Murals on Glass. We've got a program which is all putting artworks on adhesive vinyl and putting them on downtown windows in Urbana on municipal buildings. 
Um, we have a similar program called Utility Box Murals. So again, as long as you could do a digital image of, of your work, you can also have it on a Utility Box. Um, we have a sculpture program. We have a program for people interested in teaching called Young Artist Studio, where people can, on a monthly basis, we hire artists to give arts workshops to young kids. Um, and I should mention that we've had a number of programs that um, have, are made possible through collaborations here. So I'll let Kelly mention things like the Great Art Doors in more detail, um, but things like that, our poems programs, our poet, we have an, a brand poet laureate that we elect every year. So if you're more of a writer, um, that's something that you might consider as well. And then we do a number of programs that are um, kind of on pause right now due to the pandemic. And so that's been like our Art at the Market, monthly concert series, Urbana's Downtown Get Down, which was a summer festival that we had in 2019. Oh, that's a long time ago at this point. But yeah, so there's, you know, there's a lot of things that we do that we hire artists for directly through the program. But of course, I think the most important thing for you to understand is you don't have to come to our program. You can have a wonderful program idea of your own and get funding to support it. Um, whether that's an exhibition or a production or performance or any number of things, you can get funding to do that performance within the city of Urbana limits um, with support from city of Urbana taxpayer dollars. So um, that's something to know. And I'll, I'll probably go into more detail, but our applications just wrapped up and we just announced the new cycle of arts grantees. So if you're taking notes, the thing to know is that in October of 2022, we released the new application and they come due every January. And usually by mid-February, you know if you've gotten a grant or not, but that's what we manage. Thank you so much, Rachel. And Kelly, we'll let you finish us out. Okay, uh, Kelly White, Executive Director of 40 North, which is the Champaign County Arts Council. Um, we, uh, similar to Rachel, lots of different programming that uh, have opportunities for our local artists. Uh, one of the big ones obviously is coming up, it's called the Boneyard Arts Festival. Um, uh, that will be April 1st through 3rd. Anyone can be a part of Boneyard, any venue can be a venue and any artist can participate. So that's a wonderful way from, for emerging artists to get involved. Um, you can have one painting, you can have 27 paintings, anybody um, you could be a poet, you could be a performing artist, um, anyone can participate in Boneyard. Um, we also, like Rachel mentioned, we partner on a program called uh, The Great Art Doors. That call is now open for the third annual, third year of that, um, that program, which involves um, artists creating kind of outdoor temporary sculptures and slash installations that go into different parks throughout Champaign-Urbana, and they get a stipend of $1,000 um, if they are selected. Um, we'll have 11 different locations, and um, that call is open, I believe, due March mm, 21st, I believe. We also coordinate, uh, this will be the fourth year, we have the Crystal Lake Park Art Fair, which is on August 6th, um, Saturday, August 6th, so that call will be coming soon as well, so artists can apply for that market. We usually have about 40-plus uh, artists featured um, at the Crystal Lake Park Art Fair. Um, there might be another new fair coming. I can't say yet, but there's probably another fair coming in September. Um, so be on the be on the lookout for that anytime. Uh, but then we also have several programs for artists like MTD Art, where it gets your art um, up on every bus. Sky Gallery will be opening probably next week, which is where we put art on billboards. Um, and just several other we help UC rotate art inside of the bank in Urbana. Um, we do this thing called community supported art, where artists create a share of art for local shareholders who purchase uh, nine pieces of art. So lots of different programming. Um, I also feel like we just are out there to help get the word out about any other opportunities and trying to connect artists with um, other organizations or key programs or um, key people they might need to meet. So just basically being a, a liaison and an advocate for all the local artists we can um, to get the word out. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, so for those who are attending right now, uh, this is a, essentially a Q&A panel session. So we have some questions that we're going to ask our panelists, but by all means, if you have any questions, comments for all or any specific panelist, feel free to put it in the chat or raise your hand and I can unmute you so you can verbalize it. So let's go ahead and get the conversation started with kind of, all right, so I'm a maker. I want to sell my wares or I want to maybe look at other opportunities for funding something. Where do I go to find this? Where are the best places for makers to learn about these amazing local opportunities? 
and feel free to chime in. But I mean, one answer is the Champaign Public Library, but <laughs> where do you typically advertise? Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and put this out. Um, I think both Rachel and I, we tend to use social media as much as we can. Not everybody is on social media, obviously, and um, for understandable reasons, uh, but it still is the best, you know, it's pretty cheap as far as getting the word out to people. So we definitely, I think both of us try to obviously post on our own pages, share with lots of groups. So if I was a local artist, I would definitely make sure you follow 40 North, you follow the Urbana Public Arts uh, Culture and Arts Program, follow, there's um, there's the Boneyard, uh, it has a separate group. I would follow as many groups as possible because that's where a lot of the most up-to-date stuff is posted. Um, I just revamped our artist listserv that has, um, I think we're up to almost 700 artists on there. Um, it changes all the time because we do have people that leave and, and move in new. So I try to keep as up to date as possible. But if you are an artist out there and you want to get emails that basically give you a list of different opportunities, it's not just Forty North, it's any local opportunity I can find out about, which I try to keep my ear out for any calls or anything that relates to art. And then I try to send those out on a, on a relatively uh, regular basis. Um, and so I just revamped that whole thing. So I'm hoping um, to continue to take artists on that list. And that's probably a really great way of, um, if, you're, if you're up for getting an email, I try to link to all the different submission forms with all the deadline dates. I try to send reminders if I can, because I know I love a reminder if it's coming up. So I would just you know follow as many things as possible, sign up for any emails or subscrip subscriptions. Um, and then obviously, you know, places like the library and other places, I believe, um, uh, yeah, someone social media, Facebook for sure, for us anyway, as far as social media platforms, Instagram as well, but Facebook seems to, with, with the different groups that it has on there, um, seems to be the best way to be able to share different calls. So, so Instagram is, is supposedly not a great place to put ads. Um, the I, I'm the silly off. one that still puts ads on there. <laughs> I think sometimes it means that people see the ad like after the events already happened because algorithmically that just happens. Yeah. So, uh, you know, just to echo what Kelly was saying, I, you know, we try to cast a really wide net. I think among all of us, that's true. And so, you know, we also send out press releases. They, we try to get it into News Gazette, into Smile Politely, on WCIA. We try to go on CI Living when we can, if it's a bigger call, you know, it's not for maybe everything we do because they won't have us all the time, but to, for specific things. Um, so definitely, you know, just just to join those things that were mentioned, you know, get on 40 North's listserv. The Urban Arts and Culture Program has a listserv. I, we've used it. We continue to use it. I'm not as regular with it. Um, and uh, But we do try to put out a lot of information that way. Our websites, of course, detail all the programs that we have on a regular basis. Um, but the reason why we emphasize sometimes uh, like social media or checking news, newspapers and stuff like that is because we can do things more on an ad hoc basis versus, you know, we don't update websites on a daily basis, but we would update social media pages on sometimes even a daily basis. Um, a question from Jody, do we advertise with Smile Politely? The city of Urbana does advertise with Smile Politely, um, but because we advertise a number of programs through the city, I'm not always paying for advertisements or I don't, the arts program doesn't always have space. Um, so sometimes it'll be a city sustainability program or some other program that we have through the city, but we do have dedicated ad space with Smile Politely and um, on occasion the News Gazette. Um, so we do make use of some of those things. But in general, you know, one of the first things I did when I became the city's arts coordinator is I went on social media, both Instagram and Facebook, and I tried to join every Urbana arts group I could find and Champaign Urbana. So I encourage everyone here to do that too. If you use social media, go immediately on, like search for Champaign Urbana artists and join anything you possibly can. Boneyard Arts Festival has a wonderful Facebook group that's year round, um, but we also have, you know, like the people that post the, that have the Resist show, they do a Beyond the Resist art show Facebook group that encourages people who are especially interested with like kind of melding social issues with the arts, great one for you to join. Um, there's Art Nerds, which is a, a, a group that meets and sometimes does group, group critiques together. That's another group. So to really find your, your niche, you have to kind of go out and look. And that's what I encourage everybody to do, too. If you're a poet, you should be following CU Poetry Group. You know, so just kind of finding out what are those groups that are in town and how to follow them, I think, is important. I would add to that that following is great. What is even better to make sure that you really stay in the loop is actually commenting and getting involved. 
Yeah. As soon as you realize that this group is something that your heart beats for, leave a comment, leave several comments, come back because the algorithms change really fast and you're not shown anymore um, what the group is doing. Um, and so, yeah, that's something that one can do themselves. I think other than that, I would definitely echo what everyone has said in terms of listservs and email newsletters for businesses and markets. You can sign up on probably a lot of different uh, business websites and market websites to stay in the loop to be notified. Um, so that's something that you can do once in order to be notified regularly. Um, yeah, that's great, but stay involved, I would say. This is important. Thank you, Anna. Mariah, do you have anything mm -hmm. to add to it? Um, no, I think they gave some really great advice. Agreed, agreed. Okay, so um, we did have someone who tried to subscribe to one of the newsletters mentioned, but I think in the email that I'll send um, with this recording, I'll get the links from all the panelists as far as where to sign up for. So if it isn't working now, it'll work later. Mm -hmm. Fingers crossed. All right. So once someone has found a market and they're like, oh, I can do this. I have the free time. What are the things that you want to see in the applications? Or yeah, let's focus on that first. What do you want to see in applications? So that's very simple. Um, do what you're asked to do. Um, so it sounds maybe a bit silly, but it's really that uh, people can see what it is easily because it's not only for us who organize the event or the market, it's also a picture for your customers to see what they're coming for, why they're coming and to connect with them. Um, and then um, touching up to the point that uh, what we just talked about, staying connected, your social media handles, make sure they're there for Facebook and for Instagram, make sure you're easy to find, make sure it's not your personal account or your personal name, make sure it's your business or your artist name. Um, that's really, really important because organizing a market is a big event and we have to find it fast. People have to identify it. They see your sign at the market saying you're X, Y, Z. And if your handle was called differently, they will maybe not find you because there are 40 other people there. So be as clear as, and as concise as possible. That's what I would say is really important. Yeah, Thank quality, you, rather less, but better quality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would um, echo uh, loudly everything that Anna just said. Um, I mean, even down to just like what she said, follow the rules. We, you know, if, if it asks you to name an image a certain way, um, please do that. I mean, it's anything that makes it easier and faster. It's going to um, only help the jurying process. I would also, um, you know, a lot of what I run into, not only just jury, being on, you know, help organizing a jury for a market, but or organizing a jury for any of our programs, the image quality, because um, I'll, I'll even know this picture. I'll know a painting because I've seen it in person, but the image that gets sent is just not, the, not a high quality image. And so that jury doesn't get to really see the quality of their work. I think a long time ago, that was much more difficult. I think phone cameras have come a long way now. Um, so I would spend um, a lot of time trying to get very good images of your work. Because like Anna said, a lot of times we're gonna pull from those images to do any sort of marketing or social media. So that thing's gonna represent you all the way through. If you have a dynamic, good image, it's gonna pull an audience and they're gonna show up. Same, as she mentioned with the social media, um, definitely make sure that it's, it's up to date, it clicks through, you know, because I've had to kind of find and deeper and deeper and it was not quite right. And I, I couldn't, you know, so that's a lot more time on our end having to dig through. And if, and we'll do that because we need to, but someone who may be interested in your work might not take that kind of time. Um, and so just when you're filling out an application, there's a reason that someone's asking for all those different things. So make sure you do it and you do it, um, you know, in a thorough way, in a, in a quality way. And if it, and images are great. Um, and if it asks for that so many images, make sure you bring that so many images. If it asks for a specific format of those images, try your best to, to follow those regulations as much as you can. Um, yeah, I, I, would, I would definitely emphasize that a lot because I've seen people not get chosen just based on images that were not accurately portraying the artist's work. I mean, this is because I think somebody shared an image recently on Facebook with a little pie chart of the job of an artist. 
where, where the a pie chart used to be just make art and the whole pie chart was make art. And now there's one where the pie charts divided up into like, take photos, get on social media, get packaging, because that's what it's become. I mean, being an artist now is much more tremendously complicated. You're, you are selling it, you're making it, you're promoting it. It's a lot. And, um, but it's important to kind of, uh, you know, handle those roles because they all make a difference in how much you're going to sell, I think, for sure. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, do you want to go, Mariah? I'm going to give you an opportunity. <laughs> yeah. I can go after you. Okay. Um, well, I was just going to say that I echo everything that's been said already. The clear and concise were actually words I wrote down about this question. And Anna started off with those words right away. And I think that's what we always say, especially about grant writing, but it kind of goes for anything that you apply for. Um, definitely have, out, have together the who, what, where, when, and why when you're applying to propose a project. Um, what we give out is project-based grants. And if you have a great idea that's, that alone is not reason enough to give you funding for it. You need to show us that you have the legs of making that idea a reality. And that comes from actually having investigated and researched where are you having the event? What is the space rental fee? Is it built into the budget? You know, like all these kinds of questions are really well thought out. Um, and of course, I echo Kelly, one of the biggest challenges with visual art is if you don't have a good photograph of your work. Um, and so I think of it as like, the same way that you would kind of get yourself prepared if you're applying for a job, think of it that way. There's some things that you need to have. And if you have them, and once you have them, you're good to go on applying for a wide variety of things. The same goes with grants. Like once you have the bare bones of a grant project, say you didn't get funded, um, you can take that, hone it, get some feedback from the funder about why you didn't get funded, tweak it a little bit, resubmit it, because now you've got all your, your kind of ducks in a row. You've got all your pieces together to go take that same application and put it other places. So I say cast a wide net, but also have those simple things. Like I think every artist should have a wonderful headshot of themselves. I, I work a lot with artists where, you know, once they're having a solo exhibit with the city or something, they don't have a single photo of themselves. And I'm like, but I need to put a nice, wonderful photo of you on this. We need to hype you up. You're a wonderful artist. Let's tell your story. Well, then, you know, we need to go through the works of getting that for folks. And I mean, you know, long term, I want like all of us to collaborate together and we'll offer some like free photo clinic for everybody to come get like a free headshot photo and, you know, all this stuff. But ideally, you get your, your visual art photograph nicely. If you can't do it, hire somebody to do it. It's an investment and it will have return. You know, get, you know, get a nice photo of yourself. If you don't have a really well-written artist bio, get some help with writing that up. Because um, just having those little things about yourself, even if you don't have a brand shiny website or something, but when you're called upon to give it, you've got a biography ready to go, you have a photo of yourself, you have photos of your work, that's excellent. And that's going to put you, you know, just a step above a lot of other applicants. Because it's such, it's so heart-wrenching when we receive an application, but the photo taken is so dark, or you can't really see the image, or it's grainy, and we actually can't see the artwork. And so it's very hard to judge it, um, and judge it appropriately. Thank you so much. Perfect. I'm going to answer the question from um, hosting a market point of view. If you are submitting an application for the urban market, we honestly just ask that you fill it out completely. But some things that help you is making sure that you have a bio about your business or an elevator pitch or what you sell, because that's really important. And also adding your social media handles, how you can best be contacted, and then providing clear photos of your images. Um, I do have a small team, but I have someone who does the marketing for us. So although I may know about your business or I may have searched it online, um, sometimes communication, we have lapses in communication between what I personally know and what the marketing team knows. And markets are amazing because you get the foot traffic and you get sales. But the other thing that's really great about um, being a vendor at a market is the online presence and the spotlights that you get personally. And so for us, we always have a photographer every Saturday to take photos of people's uh, things that they're selling because we know that photography can run pretty expensive and we want them to have professional photos. Um, but it's really, really important that you that we have something to post online prior to us getting those photos for you because that is part of the sale. You know, when you think about even the food industry, you see the food, it looks delicious, and now you're hungry, so you go buy it. So although someone may not attend the market, they see that you've been posted, they see all the amazing things you have to sell, and then they go to either their social media handle or your website to order. So. I think that's so true, and I also think that, like, 
I mean, I think of some of the photos I use for musicians and almost like nine times out of 10, Kelly White took it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So I think, and, and I believe I'm probably the same thing too with some of the folks for tabling and businesses. Mariah, you probably took it. You know, it's like, there's so many ways I think that we do try to help artists as much as we can at the events that we have going on. And then, you know, where we can photo crediting each other, but using them because sometimes that is the best photo that we got of you right now. We'd love to have a photo of you in action, you know? So, so I think the other thing to remember is this is a small community and because it's small, it's personalized. So one thing that we didn't say earlier, but it's like reach out directly. I think every one of us, when we receive an email directly, you know, asking us about opportunities, we'll give you a response. We'll give you a rundown of deadlines that are coming up if we if we can, you know, have something to share with you at the time. Um, so that's another thing, you know, making that personal contact, whether you come to an event and like say hello and, you know, ask, ask for information. We're happy to also give it that way. Thank you. And I love how that, oh, sorry, go ahead, Anna. Sorry, I would probably try to add that a lot of times this photo taking um, is going for authenticity and for originality because that's the reason why a lot of people like to support the artist. They are looking to add something that the artist has to say to their life. That's a huge compliment and I think with those photos that's a part of the picture that we're trying to get. Um, yeah, and so that's why it's important to show who you really are, uh, what your work really is, and, and that that's authentic, and that makes the work so much more valuable. Yeah. Fantastic. I love how this accompany, accompanies kind of like a holistic view of organizing markets or grant opportunities, because again, it is a small, really personal community, but putting a face to the people who are in charge of these events too kind of helps break down a lot of those barriers. And I love Rachel that you mentioned how just reach out. I think I'm making an assumption here, but I'm assuming that everyone here would be perfectly fine if you had a question about one of the applications, reach yeah. out. Oh yeah. I'm and really uh, and I'll put in here, definitely reach out and maybe reach out again if I don't get back to you right away. <laughs> yes. uh, because uh, both Rachel and I, well, I don't know for how long, but Rachel for right now, anyway, yeah. right? We're both so yeah, for the foreseeable future. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes maybe just follow up. It doesn't mean I don't yeah. want to respond, just but but I have no problem with somebody following up and reminding me, did you have to answer this question? Just just make sure you remind me because <laughs> there's a chance that it gets buried. But yeah. I want to answer all the questions. I think all of us here are often running the show almost entirely on our own with our organizations. And even though we use we language, like we at the Urbana Arts and Culture Program, or yeah. we here, or we there, the truth of it is it's often been a one person show for a while. And so that's just something, you know, to know, to not, you know, it's not an excuse, but it's to understand that we're often juggling a lot. And so I echo that too. Like if you don't get a response right away. Feel free to follow up. I don't feel bad being pestered at all. It's actually very um, helpful. I love. I'm. I'm fine with it. It's best. Mm -hmm. It's good for me. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> we love the honesty. All right. So um, we have a question from a participant. What is the criteria you use to choose candidates for a market? So, so I'll go first. Um, the only market that um, we've often done. Um, would be ones that have kind of happened on an ad hoc basis for the arts program. Um, but some of the same things apply for grants too. We're looking for artistic quality. So uh, again, the things that we'll take to, to examine what artistic quality is, is gonna be your work samples. If you're applying for a market, I also really recommend that you have a picture of your booth, your booth setup. That's something that's come up a lot. Like when Kelly and I ran the Urbana Art Expo, we're like, okay, this person has great art, but are they going to be at a card table with some prints set out or are they going to do a thing? And so it's really helpful for us to see that as an example. So even if it doesn't ask for it, I'd say put that in there. Show that you've got a really cool dynamic setup at your table. How do you make that table look like a store, right? <laughs> make, make it look interesting. And there's a lot of suggestions that like, you know, for things like the Art Expo, we would have a, um, you know, a, a orientation meeting and we would give you guys advice about these are some things that you could do to like spiffy your table up, you know, and, but make sure you're also bringing things like business cards, information, you know, all the other kind of doodads that you'd have at your table. But then you can also make use of like baskets or like, like lateral things that you're putting, you know, man-made made things that you put your stuff on. Um, 
you know, different tiers and stuff, creating some depth with the table. That's really huge. And being able to have a visual for that makes us more excited to have you there because we're confident that you're going to bring that to the space. Thank yeah, you, I, I would uh, I would agree with that for sure. We uh, actually for the Crystal Lake Park Art Fair, one of the requirements is to send a picture of your booth. And so I know artists that have been like perfecting their booths for decades, you know, getting it just right, getting the walls they like the best, getting how they like to display. Um, so definitely that booth picture is huge because one of the things that I've seen juries get very turned off when we've done juries for the market is when the artwork, when you would like maybe say you look at three or four pieces of art and you would possibly think that it's by four different artists. Um, there's something about really knowing that you've honed it and you have, you have your style and it is what you do best. And then you even have excellent branding behind it as well. But if you have all different types of artwork that possibly could be done by different people, it almost kind of has this, this idea that maybe um, you know, you're not quite ready yet to be kind of branding yourself and going out into the market world. Um, and so I would think very cohesive, obviously good images, definitely affect juries. Um, even what we just talked about, storytelling, people want to fall in love with you. If you have, you do a great bio or you talk about your artwork very well, juries love that. So if you have high quality art and then you can talk about it well in a bio, in an artist statement, juries really um, are taken by that. And so I would think that the quality of the art, the quality of the the booth and the branding level as far as where you've gotten with what your look is and what what your art is, what niche your art is in. Um, and if that is, you know, if it's compelling um, and you and everything else looks great, I mean, you're going to have a very strong shot at getting into any market that I've coordinated as far as the jurying process. Thank you. Mariah? Yep. Uh, for the urban market, um, it was originally created in 2019 because um, there was um, a problem in the area where we saw that historically and presently that Black-owned businesses have been denied loans and um, access to capital. So in order to negate that, we decided to host an inclusive pop-up shop. And so uh, there's no set criteria to participate other than you actually having something to sell. Um, it's actually an entry level for people who are artists or small business owners who may even just want to give this thing a chance. Like they just have an idea and they want to try to bring it to life. And this is a good market um, that's from August to September to see if you can gain brand recognition, to see if you have a story, you know, to, to, to really test it out and to give um, people the opportunity to do so. I know some of the markets in the area require you to have insurance. And so at this market, we actually purchase insurance for all of our vendors. So there's a really low in entry fee for you to participate. And like I said, all you really need is a table. Um, we don't look for any fancy setups or anything like that. Most of our vendors are like in art, food, beauty, skin, hair, clothes, jewelry, um, and all those other things, but it's really it's really meant to be inclusive of all Champaign County. But we do strive to make sure it's representative of everyone in all skin tones. So that's amazing. I love how accessible that is. And I did share information in chat. So that's the urban market. Yeah, for us, for a market, for the Little Red Hat, for a BAM, that's Boneyard Arts Market. Um, all those are different events that have different audiences and um, have a different vibe. So we are looking for artists or crafters and designers um, who fit that vibe and that audience because we would like the artist and the target customer at the end to go home happy. Um, so that is the experience that we like to curate um, and for our vendors, let's just say vendor, that could be a crafter, an artist, and a designer, or anything in between, um, we look for originality. That is huge. Are you, as we started, kept talking about, are you communicating who you are? Are you communicating what you love? Are you communicating what you have to add to someone's life? Are you able to light that spark in someone with your work? Um, that's something we look for. Authenticity is a big deal and quality. There are huge differences when it comes to craft and design, especially um, also in quality. I could give a specific example, maybe that's helpful. Sure, yeah. For us, 
For us, for example, we would look if we have a soap vendor for a more craft type market as a gift, is the soap made completely from scratch? Is there, you know, are the fragrances good quality? Um, are there oils in there, butters in there? Or is it a melt and pour soap? So to us, melt and pour has its place. That is wonderful. But if it's an artisan craft market, we are looking for the real handmade, the high quality ingredients, because that's what our audience used to us providing. So that's what we're looking for. And it's not a judgment for the product not having its place, but it is so that we are asking for the specific product quality in the markets. So that's definitely something. And then I can definitely also echo the setup of the booth. It doesn't have to be fancy though. You don't have to go and build your plywood thing. You can have a table if you have a nice tablecloth on there. That's fine. As long as everything is clean represented um, and it's just well to see what you have and it fits your identity, that's cool. It's not that it has to be whatever amazing decorated setup. We want the goods to shine and you shine along with them. And so that's, yeah, that's a criteria. And then of course, photos play into that and social media handles, that's important. And also I should say, is the range of goods that you have, does that actually make sense? Or is that all over the place? Do you do a little bit of that, but really you love to do that and you just throw that in? We are looking for the things that you're really passionate about because that's again, what lights the spark in the customers that are gonna see you and fall in love with your product. Yeah, that's it from me. Oh, I just wanted to add one thing because I uh, thought about it when both Mariah and, and Anna's comments. Uh, also what probably works well if possible, is to have price range. Yes. Um, because obviously, you know, you, people come to these markets and they, they so want to, you know, if they like you or they like your stuff, they want to have a little piece of that to take home. And so to have a wide range of options for people from yeah. cards that are something that more affordable all the way up to maybe a very, you know, dramatic piece that maybe somebody falls in love with in the moment. But uh, it's very critical to have that, that wide range because a lot of people want something from you, but they might not be able to afford something very expensive. But they would love to take something home. So we yeah. always emphasize making sure there's a, a, a wide variety of price points. Yeah. And for our markets, just to add that, I think a great price range for our markets would be anywhere from five to 50, maybe $75, just so that you know that maybe you did ask for a market that we do. I don't know that to the person who asked the question, but it should be approachable for the markets that we do. Since I talk much about quality, I feel like I should put a stop. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and I like how this conversation is about the audience as well. So mm -hmm. it seems like a really great idea for those who are interested in maybe um, getting to know if this is something they want to do is just attend some markets oh, that yeah. are in the area, because then you can kind of see, well, what's currently being produced? What niche am I fitting into? Um, do you think the other people surrounding you at this market would also be invested and interested in your goods? So yeah, love this conversation. Definitely. Yeah, so we have another question from the audience. Where are places we can look to research markets in Illinois, but maybe outside of Champaign-Urbana? So there's things like Festival Net. Do you use that, Kelly, for like Crystal Lake Park? Or I listed the Art Expo there a few times, but it was like, I don't know how many folks are using it regularly. Yeah, when we used it, we got we got a lot of vendors that were not art related on mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Um, uh, I know the uh, Chicago Artists Coalition, I think, has a, an open call listing. I think that's most of all of Illinois, I think, mm -hmm. um, if people upload it to it. But it's a whole, they've got a call for artist section, I think, on their website that probably is all of Illinois, not just this area. But, um, yeah, that, that's, yeah, there's a few different places where you can kind of search out calls for either Midwest or, you know, Different, different parts of Illinois, Central Illinois. I don't know if there's one just for Central Illinois. There's Art Midwest. I don't know if they have open calls listed on there. It's, it's hard because it depends on who is submitting, you know, the listings and if they're up to date and things like that. I'm a yeah. big fan of like the Google search. <laughs> I just feel like, it, I mean, this day and age, I feel like, you know, just even saying like Googling festival, the season, the, the year, the region and seeing what comes up. Um, I used the same when I was a student trying to find scholarships and I had a lot of success with it. And I think that it's, you know, not, um, not to be underrated, but I also, um, depending on your medium, you may also look for specific kinds of spaces like 
Um, I use, I'm a writer, so I use Submittable actually to find things, find publishing opportunities for myself. Uh, there are visual art opportunities on Submittable, um, so it's submittable.com, um, but you can use the discover feature to just look up opportunities for yourself. And there definitely are visual art opportunities, a number of them, but I would say especially so if you're a writer, if you're, if you're a poet, like that's a place to go. Um, so depending on what art form we're talking about right now, you might just kind of look at these different things. I know the question came maybe from markets, but to try to also search for um, now, you know, days we have a lot of like online listings of opportunities. So like online listings of grant opportunities or these kinds of things. Um, I'll see if I can put some in the chat that as I'm thinking about it, but um, definitely using it, some search tools to see what might be out there and actually joining those, those newsletters or those listservs would be a great way. Yeah, because like, like McLean County, nearby counties, if you want to research in here, because they obviously they have a couple of huge art fairs and many artists from here get featured in them. Um, so they've got a couple of markets there. So you yeah, have nearby counties, if you check out, if you want to not have to do the whole state uh, regionally, I believe there's quite a few other markets that are in nearby counties. Because like McLean has, you know, a version of 40 North, obviously that's McLean County, and they do two specific, very large festivals and markets that a lot of our artists have been featured in from Champaign County. And I know, Anna, like you, you being a business owner yourself, you may go to some of the other festivals, but by and large, I, I don't exhibit myself at festivals, so I'm not going to know, but I would suggest ask a, a local artist that you see exhibiting everywhere. Where do they go? What are the festivals? Because they will also know the stuff that's not on the website. <laughs> How did it go there? Was it well organized? Was it a nightmare? You know, what are some yeah. things to consider? How did you do? What were the sales like? I would ask somebody personally about those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah and that's what I was going to include in. Oh, I sorry. Would say no, that no. <laughs> Let's let Mariah go. It's okay. <laughs> um, sure I'll just quickly about. respond just because I want to say it. Just, just would take that with a grain of salt. I would definitely ask. I agree. Always connect because personal engaging personally engaging with someone definitely brings you closer however I think that even if someone would maybe discourage you they might not have had the right product maybe the weather was bad or you know <laughs> it was a tough day in the community before I don't know there could be so many reasons and you might have asked the person that didn't do well at that market so if you find something about that I would definitely as Rachel said like do research around this event maybe go there as a visitor or write the um, people they can also tell you um, what their reach actually is for the event they should be able to answer that when they advertise what's the reach for the event what's the visitor number they should roughly have an idea of that and then make your own experiences we as Norden Design or as people have made very different experiences at events than other people and we've asked so I would say go ask talk engage chat and communicate but Go your own way. Thank you so much. Sorry, and then just to add to that, I always want to say word of mouth is always really powerful. I remember doing my first market. Um, I believe it was the Champagne Farmers Market. And then I went on to the Urbanus Farmers Market. And then somehow you found me in Bloomington for Bloomington Farmers Market, which was preposterous, but it was it, it was really nice there. And I would talk with some of the people and they, of course, everyone would say, how was your sales today? Or how did today go? Um, and then they would talk about the markets that are upcoming, or they would say, you know, I won't be here in a few weeks because I'm going to this market, or I'm, I can't, I really hope I get into this market. Like it's always packed. There's always so many people and this is the market you want to be a part of. So talking to people, it's really, really important. And also if you do have a niche item that you sell, which was always the case for me, understanding if you fit into the audience of the market of the people it would draw, if um, it's a place where you will be welcomed, and if it's a place where you feel like it's a great fit for the things that you sell. I think that's really important when it comes to word of mouth. Absolutely. Thank you, Mariah. And just to clarify, Kelly, the county you had mentioned earlier that has the really great art fair, was it McLean? McLean, yeah, it's where Bloomington McLean. Normal is, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, and one thing that also comes to mind as someone who's also a maker in the community, um, don't underestimate the power of community groups on Facebook. Uh, we had mentioned it earlier, but I know... Um, just by, again, you could do a Google search or even just searching on Facebook using the search tool for 
art markets or markets or festivals. I believe there are several groups for Central, Southern, and Western Illinois. So go ahead and find. So we do have another question. If I'm going to sell my art through one of your markets, what business requirements do I need? For example, tax ID or maybe a sole proprietorship, LLC? Um, for usually what happens with us is they, uh, the state will get wind of like, let's say when we had Crystal Lake Park Art Fair, they'll like, oh, you're promoting this event and we will, they will, the, they'll send us the tax form that is required for people selling. Uh, you don't have to LLC, you could just fill it out, um, you know, with your social security number, but they do require that you fill out the tax form with what, you know, you were, you made that day and report it, um, to the state. But that's the only thing that, uh, is required. And what we do is we put it, we print out a, a printout of it and put it in the artist packets at the, so they have it there with them, or if they want to do it online, but we include it in there and that's, but it, you don't have to have a, a special EIN number or anything. You can use your own social security number, but you do have to report the money that you make at the fair. And pay any necessary sales tax. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and oftentimes like we will we'll have that available for you to do right right then and there. But that's the same goes for the farmer's market and things like that. If you use any, especially any city programs, they're going to be pretty diligent about that. We as business are required to actually pass on the names of the people who we have at the event. Mm -hmm. So we have to pass on the names of our vendors to um, Paris. So yeah, we pass on those forms as well, but you, you got to fill that out. Yeah, they they obviously pay attention because, like I said, we we would we barely promote a Crystal Lake Park Art Fair, and I got an email right away. So obviously they have uh, they get they get notified when something new is happening. So um, yeah, got <laughs> to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. We have about 15 minutes left, so I have a couple of other questions that we have, but now's the time to put your questions through. So once a maker is accepted into the market, what are some of the best practices? Maybe talk about market etiquette a little bit. Um, I, di I did want to mention it earlier. I think we kind of said it before, but um, I, I, I don't, I can't emphasize enough uh, as an artist, I think to go to a market, not, not as an artist, go, go as a buyer. Because I think it's such a, it's an interesting experience to buy art and um, the smallest things can bring you in or turn you away. You know, um, the artist just smiling at you and welcome you to their booth, right? Being, being kind of friendly and, and you know, uh, inviting you to look at something versus, you know, they're on their phone way in the back and they don't really notice you're there. The smallest things can, can do something like that for you. Like, let's say you just fall in love with this one little piece. You're like, oh man, I want that so bad, but there's nobody here. You know, it's, you got to get those moments when you get them. But if you go to a, go to an event as a, an art buyer, let's say, and walk around, and I think you can, you can learn an endless amount as far as best practices as how to run your own booth and how to greet people that could be purchasing, because you don't know, this could be the, this person's last 20 bucks that they're spending, they're spending on this thing because they love it that much. And it's, it doesn't have to be 2000. It could literally be 20 bucks and it's going to, it's, it's so important to them and they're so in love with it. And it literally be probably the last stuff they could spend that week. So no matter what someone's buying, it's, it's a critical, it's a critical relationship between you and that person that's buying that. I can't emphasize that enough because I go to places and I try to support art as much as I can. And it is interesting how the different experiences will affect me even. And that piece will carry that experience. Like I'll take it home and hang it up. And if it was a wonderful experience and I kind of fell in love with it, I look at it every day and I remember that. I mean, it's, it's a really weird relationship. I know artists get very caught up in making their work, but they've got to try to think if they can of what it feels like to be that other person. I think it helps you hugely on how to best sell your work, I think. Thank you. Yeah. I know one thing I've helped Anna um, previously with some mistletoe markets. And one thing that um, it's so important to be aware of how you're communicating and even just be readily in contact. Anna, do you want to talk about that a little bit more? Um, yeah. In what sense? <laughs> or just like um, if you apply for a market, uh, be ready to answer some emails or to oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, be be readily available in that sense. Yeah, I think we experience that often um, that 
people also sometimes apply and then they don't follow through or they we go through all the um process of accepting someone i have this other thing and you know eh. so i think what's good is that if you apply for a market that you have time to come to the market you're planning on going you're excited about it um and you you know submit the fee submit your pictures um right away when you're asked to not in the third asking email and i think that's good i think it's just a respectful communication that you have we're providing an experience for an opportunity for the vendor and an experience you know for future customer vendor relationships and so i think that's I think as every conversation that you would have with someone or every service that you would like to have provided, um, yeah, you just want to hold up your end of the bargain because it's an experience that goes both ways, I think. I think it's also good to remember that like um, yeah, not every, good. oh, I'm sorry, Anna. Treat everyone like you would like to be treated. No, I'm good. Well Go. said. I was going to mention that I think it's also good to remember, and a lot of artists report this to us, that it's not just the sales that are made day of at the event, but that connection is actually really fruitful. Like if you can get somebody to take your business card, if you can use the event, um, you know, don't just sit back and let your table live without you. You need to be a present part of your booth and, you know, engage people as they come, make conversation. You don't have to be a super hard salesperson, but you could also, you know, take some time to really get to know people that come up to your booth and like what's, what's speaking their interest today. Um, tell them a little bit about your work and, and its uniqueness um, because that's too where people will call back later and remember like this person does commissions or this person will do photography or you know this person is saying I want to call for this so remember that the sales also come after and it's a really great marketing opportunity to build that relationship for oftentimes a bigger sale later. I would add to that that oftentimes in my experience even from selling my own goods um, a sale isn't always is made right away there are several points of trust several points of contact um and not everyone is ready to spend right away i think right now we're looking at especially with the products that we make have um a lot of customers that are very reflected uh, we make meaningful goods that are supposed to add quality to your everyday life and they're not disposable goods so compared to fashion we don't do fast fashion we do very sustainable once of your life once in your lifetime type goods so i think the people uh, our customers understand that and so we don't expect them to bang of the back be ready i mean we we hope they understand what you know and we can communicate in an understandable manner what we're doing but people reflect and we appreciate that and so while we do ending out I think we're freezing up a little bit, Anna. Um, so, it's like you think it's gonna. Well, Mariah, did you want to add anything? I think let's try to. Anna, feel free to come out and then come back if you think that might this help. Yes, I want to say that um, for me at my market, one of the most pressing things that I go around and ask is um, about what they're selling. Um, a lot of times the business owner or the artist, they put so much work into making, you know, the product and then applying and submitting photos and coming on time and setting up their booth and their stand. And by the time they get to that interaction part and someone's really invested into the item and they want to know the story behind it, um, there's nothing there. They're just like, this is what I have, but tell me about it. And they're like... No. <laughs> so I remember at one market, there was this amazing lady who sell, sold uh, natural hair oils. And I was interested because I use it for my hair. And so I was like, um, do you make these from scratch? And she's like, yeah, they're, it's made from scratch and they're hair oil. And I was like, okay, well, what made you start making hair oil? She's just like, 
I use it on my hair. And I'm like, no, you got to tell me more. Like, I'm going to need more than this. And after talking with her for about 30 minutes, it's something that was passed down from her grandmother and something that she had been using since she was younger. And so it had this really cool backstory to the hair oil. And I was like, if you would have just told me this 30 minutes ago, you would have already had to sell. I had to like get it out of you. And I think oftentimes, Artists and business owners aren't that comfortable talking about their product or they're not so sure about it. So just knowing who you are and what you're selling in short, concise statements, knowing your target audience is what's really important. We're here for an elevator pitch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Quick question. What are booth fee ranges? Well, I, I mean, uh, Chris Lake Park Art Fair is 75 bucks. Um, it's a huge range. Basically what I think in general you have to go by, because it'll go up to $300, $400, depending if it's multi-day. I think probably the one I think at Bloomington, they get 30,000 people that come to that. So it, the booth range, I think this price range depends on, you know, how long it is, if it's multi-day. And then also if they're going to guarantee you 30,000 people walking by your booth, yeah, they're going to charge you a little bit more, but it, it it's a full range of basically we only just charge enough to just help us uh, pay back some of the, coordination of putting the effort on we don't make money from the event but uh but it's a wide range you probably have 50 to 75 and then I think it go it goes up from there depending on um like I said how many days it is and how much of an audience they can guarantee that is going to be there to sell your work because obviously if you pay three four hundred dollars for your booth but you make you know five thousand that weekend it works out but uh, I think there's a pretty wide range from what I have seen when I've researched it yeah, for the urban market, um, if you for last year prices and this year's prices will probably be very similar or, or even more um, affordable, especially since it's been the pandemic. But uh, if you were a member of Five Black Chambana, it was a $25 drop in fee. Um, and then if you were a non member, it was a $50 drop in fee. So we hope to have something very similar or a little bit less expensive. Well, not expensive, but a little bit less um, costly. <laughs> Yeah, Urbana's market at the square is a $25 daily drop-in fee, um, but then there is a season-like fee as well, and it's $585. I had to look it up because I couldn't quite remember. <laughs> and there is discounts if you sign, like right now, they're currently accepting vendors for the summer. So if you sign up early, there's also discounted rates for the full season. And there are a number of arts vendors at the Urbana Farmers, Urbana's market at the square. So that's right in um, Lincoln Square Mall parking lot on Vine in Illinois. And Anna, we're talking about the range of booth fees. Yeah, our booth fees are between fifty and seventy-five dollars. That's fantastic. Okay, one more question, and it's lovely and philosophical. Why do you think it's? What do you think is the main reason people buy art, specifically art, especially at markets? Huh. I, think I think they want something unique. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Maria. <laughs> Yeah. I was like, let me go first. So I, you know, oh, go. <laughs> I don't have to be like, yeah, what she said. <laughs> I think that it speaks to uh, either where they are mentally in their life now or, or from understanding where they have been or where they want to go. I think that oftentimes we buy things that resonate with us as who we are as individual people. And I know I've done that with my own, with buying artwork. So Thank you. Yeah. Does it identify with me, as Mariah said? And does it add maybe a quality or a value, a reminder, a memory to my life? I think that's what people are looking for. That's what I would say I am looking for. Yeah. Rage? <laughs> yeah, something unique. I, when I'm shopping, I want to find something that's like, I can't get it anywhere else. I love the idea that it's locally made by somebody down the street in Urbana. <laughs> you know, it's nice to know that it comes from somewhere so close. Um, it feels more sustainable. You know, all those values come into play too. Um, but certainly something that matters not just to me, but to the person who made it, that it has some meaning. And yeah, I do often like to hear the story behind it, something that we can never do when we buy mass made things. We don't hear any stories behind those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you and you just, I mean, I try to tell people, you you just won't ever regret it, you know? It, it, mm -hmm. it is, uh, all the pieces of art that I have in my house, I just, it's so, it's so different to have them versus buying something at Target or, you know, 
it has that whole person's life and experiences behind it. Like we're saying, it resonates with you. I tend to like really sad things. So if it like has like full of sadness and emotion, I just freaking love it. And so, um, yeah, it just, it speaks to you and it will continue to speak to you. And you kind of remember, because it's, it's got a history built into it. it. It has somebody's whole other life behind that, putting their experiences into it. And then now you have it. And it, it's, uh, it's magical. That's why I always tell people it, it's, it, it's affordable. There is affordable art. Don't spend it at, on mass market stuff. If you're going to get a gift for somebody, if you're going to get, you know, if you want a little vase, we got people that make vases. If you want a card, we got people who make cards. Instead of investing in all the mass market stuff, buy it from an artist. You will not regret it. And if you buy it from someone else, they're going to love you for it. That's fantastic. Yeah. Kelly, you mentioned you love buying things that make you sad. I think I love getting things that either remind me of, like they affirm me of who I am, or they push me towards growth. Like they're really uncomfortable to look okay, at. Yeah. I need to grow into that. <laughs> nice. I love these answers. Well, fantastic. So quick last question to wrap us up. Um, what are local resources you recommend uh, that, and don't say the library because I'm going to finish us out with that one, um, <laughs> <laughs> but what, what are local resources you think would really benefit those who are interested in this, this kind of industry? I mean, I think we've mentioned a whole bunch tonight. The one I wanted to say, which sounds corny, but it's not, it's other artists. I mean, I work with a lot of musicians with Friday Night Live and music is, is such an automatically collaborative feeling because you're in bands and this drummer, you know, does drumming for all different people. But the art, you know, fine art can also be very collaborative. And I feel very fortunate because I feel like we have this wonderful kind of supportive group of artists in this town and they support each other. They help each other. They give each other advice. They make recommendations. So sometimes the best place you can find the best information is from other wonderful local artists. And we've got a killer group. And I will do our best to connect them together. But to me, that's one of the one of the best resources we have are the other artists in town. Fantastic. I completely agree. Great. Well, on that note, I I'm wanted gonna... to add something. Sorry. Go <laughs> at it. No, no, go for um, it. One thing that I, you know, focusing on markets, it does, uh, I, I've had a lot of thoughts about grants, but I, I want to like say a few things that I think are maybe relevant to both, but specifically grants, is that we offer actually a lot of mentorship opportunities. And I think that's true kind of between all of us too. Like everybody on this panel does a lot for local artists and business owners. And, you know, really, you know, connecting, I think is really huge and taking advantage of those opportunities. When somebody applies for an Urbana Arts Grant and they've attended an Urbana Arts Grant workshop or watched it online, they've come to my drop-in hours, um, they've gotten feedback and, and implemented it into their proposal, you can tell it is dramatic, you know, and you can tell in the review process. So, um, you know, it's there's nothing wrong with, at, with reaching out in advance of a deadline, emphasis on in advance of a deadline, <laughs> don't do it the day it's due per se, but, you know, reach out in advance of a deadline, say, hey, I'm thinking about applying to this. I was thinking about, you know, these as my work samples. What do you think? Especially when it comes to arts grants, I'm not a voting member of the jury. So I am really in a great position to make sure you put your best foot forward in front of that jury. And I have no concerns with giving you like oodles of feedback on your proposal. And you can come to me when it's just an idea and you can come to me when you've got some bones about it and we can still try to like look at those and see, do we have the who, what, where, when, and why? Like what's what's all together there? Um, I can, I've also worked with people who have a project idea, but they're trying to find partners and they're not sure. I love connecting people. It's like the thing I love to do most. So if you have an idea, but you don't know who to partner with, like I'll think of a lot of different folks together with you and we'll work together to partner. Thank you, Rachel. Mariah or Anna, do you want to add anything? That's just something we've done at Norden too. If someone wasn't sure if they were good enough, they said, oh, I'm not sure if my product's good enough for the market, just talk to us. Just send an email, say, hey, I'm so-and-so and we've met and yeah. And we usually help you, then you can come. We've done this just at the last Mistletoe Market. There were two vendors who said, oh, I'm not sure. And that worked out really great. They were both there. So as Rachel said, reach out, talk. We're happy to help. Thanks, Anna. 
Great. Because it's like a lot of the feedback that you got tonight, we can give you actually individually, you know, we can tell you, hey, you know, this, this, like, you know, brand is beautiful, but you are like, excellent at what you do right over here. Have you thought about expanding that a little bit more? You know, we can tell you, hey, these work samples could use some better lighting. You know, we can do all of that well in advance so that you're more prepared when the deadline does approach. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Rachel and everyone. So just kind of quick, quick kind of thing on other resources that we have, especially when we were talking about things earlier today. Um, we mentioned a lot of branding, marketing. At the library, we've partnered with um, the Brand Hub out of the Siebel Center. You can get one-on-one -on -one consultations with faculty, with experienced students, and even some um, graduates. So if you want one-on-one -on -one assistance with branding, with marketing, uh, send me an email and I can get you into one of these events. Rachel had also mentioned um, headshots. You should totally get a headshot. Actually, in April, we just published these events. So very exciting. Anna Longworth is going to be providing some headshots. You can sign up. Um, I believe, feel free to go to email us at librarian at champagne.org because it looks like we don't have the signups live yet. Um, I hope Jordan, my the career librarian, is okay with me kind of announcing these. I'm just really pumped. Um, and then also, if you need assistance kind of learning how best to photograph your product, um, in April, we're having Level Up Your Brand with Photography. This is Tate Yvette Campbell and Holly Birch Smith. And essentially, tell us what smartphone you're using. They're going to teach you how to photograph your items. So even feel free if you sign up, bring your items in and get some solid tips from these professional photographers. So a lot of really cool stuff at the library. Yes, I'm biased, but we have some amazing opportunities for entrepreneurs. Um, well, fantastic. Well, if there's anything else you guys want to share, uh, thank you all for attending tonight. We went over a little bit. Um, thank you, Anna Gooch of Papapo and Norden, uh, Mariah Madison of Buyback Shambana, Rachel Lauren Storm of the Urbana Public Arts Grant, and Kelly White of 40 North. Um, so big round of applause. This was so much fun to spend my Monday night with y'all. And I look forward to hearing about the other markets happening in our community and when they do. So yes, thank you so much and have a wonderful Thanks. evening. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Thank you. <laughs>